Hi, do Matthew. My name is Dirt Daly. Jerry, people call me. I was born in Chantilly, uh, Reddington Road, Chantilly. Um, is, at the time, it was called a Corporation Estate. Now they're called, I think, City Council Estates. Lovely, beautiful area to grow up in. Great neighbours, great friends, great family and all the rest of it. In the 60s that I grew up in, it was always a happy atmosphere in the house. But I suppose, like most people at the time, be it Chantilly, Cladabour, more, it was a struggle in the sense of our dad was in England working like most dads at the time. Myself, my brother David, who passed away last June, sadly, and my last sister Anne, we wouldn't have seen our dad. He, he was in England while we were kids and he died in England. So it was a struggle for the mother, God rest her. She, I mean, there was a lot of kids in the family, you know, there were um, not, a lot of, not a lot of finance going around at the time. There was no unemployment, there was no nothing. But um, that said, there was always great laughter in the house, great storytelling in the house. And it was a case of... Uh, most people in Chantilly would have known each other. The street we grew on in Renton Road, there was 30, a total of 13 houses. And the, it was a, the old story of knock at any door, you were welcomed in, you got what was on the table with them. And it may not have been a lot, but you got it. And it was just happy, happy, but also struggles. There was 14 children born in my house, and there was 11 lived. Now, my mother wouldn't ever talk about the, the hardship that she went through, but obviously looking back on reflection, it had to be a struggle for her, Matthew, in the sense of, as, to, to repeat it again, there was no things like now with social welfare and help and whatever. Um, she was a very placid woman. She was originally from Furbo and she moved in not far from where we are here in Black Rock down to a place down there called Flay Lane. I wouldn't think many people know Flay Lane now, but it's a little roadway down by Claude's Casino down that way. And uh, very bright woman, very saintly woman, and very gentle woman, yeah. A friend of mine, he was, I work in the Nottingham Car Centre, and he was just in for a chat with me. And we were just reflecting back on the times of our school days and our work days and so on. And he said to me, you know, he's, he'd be about two years older than me, Matthew, and he was always asking me, he said, how did we struggle, Jared, going back when you think of it? And I said, it was kind of a case, I believe, that whether it be a good or bad, that we had a thing called acceptance, whereby you just got up with your life, no matter what was in front of you, you, you challenged it. And the story I was telling you, Matthew, one time was where I applied for a job, and I was, I was very young at the time, admittedly, and uh, the foreman said to me, unfortunately, I don't think you'd be able for this job. And when I went home to my mum, she said to me, she said, he obviously doesn't know that hunger is a great medicine, you know? But she was, she was a very bright woman. She'd always uh, say to me, if somebody is out and they're in a bad humour, never look at the person, look at the reason. You know, she was a very placid lady and, I, you know, that's just the way she was, yeah. What was school like for you? I suppose, to be very truthful about it, not, not, I'm not going back to the negative road of talking how hard it was, but it was hard. It, was, it wasn't easy for us. I would have left school at 12 and I, my first employment at that age was uh, down again in Salt Till down here, in the Wimpy in Salt Till. Myself and my brother Dave started working there for the summer and the seasons and um, Mr Shields, the owner, was just like a second mother to us really, you know, and she guided us through life and that school in itself, it, it wasn't nice, Matt, you know, I have to say, it, and, and a lot, I know it's not me being paranoid about this, a lot reflected on where you came from, you know, sadly, that bit of discrimination was there, of course, we were too young to understand it then. But it wasn't nice, no, I have to say it wasn't nice. And the reason, I was actually looking at a photograph there in an old St. Patrick's uh, magazine about four years ago, maybe. And I just remember looking at the photograph and thinking, he's dead, he's dead, he's a drug addict. He's, And I just thought, like, what the hell did they do to us, you know? But like that, I went on and I got out with my life and I just, thankfully still do, just get up every morning and go on with it and that's it. Could you tell us your journey into football? Yeah. I, I was lucky in that what we had up in Chantilly was called street football, out in the street. You got a kick, you got up, and you just got on with it, you know. So then I was, I kind of started off with a lovely, loveliest gentleman you could possibly ever meet, Michael O'Connor, West United. To this day, still involved with the club, a lovely man. He'd often come to Chantilly with his bike and bring three of us down on his bike down. We used to train in Fodderbrook Park at the time. So then I, would, I played with West for a good few years as a child, and then I went on to play with Garber Rovers. And then, I'm not sure the year, Matthew, maybe 1977, 76, in that era, they went into League of Ireland football. So I was lucky in that football kind of saved me in a lot of ways, you know. It was my life, it was part of everything I did every day. Met great people to this day, still, thankfully, still my friends. He interviewed one two weeks ago, Tommy Lally. I believe he went on and played for Celtic. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's just, sport, I suppose, is a great learner in life. It keeps you, you know, and you can also learn as much from losing as you do from winning, you know. And that's, that, I think it's very important, yeah. yeah. Has Galway changed since you were a young fella? It has, of course, Matthew. I think all societies, everything changes. I mean, you have to go with the change. The, the obvious question most people will ask you is, is it for the good or the bad? 
My view on Galway, like any other city, Dublin, Cork, whatever, we have, you know, people coming in from foreign countries and so on. And it's, 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 it's good in the sense of different cultures, different understandings of the people. Galway, for me, I suppose, where we're sitting here today, this will never change. It is what it is. You have the sea comes in, the sea goes out. And I sit here some days after my swim and I'd watch the birds and, you know, they don't struggle. You know, they just get up and thrive. Galway, to me, is absolute paradise. It really is. I love Galway. I love everything about Galway. There's good days and bad days in Galway. The weather is bad and so on. But in relation to changing, absolutely it's changed, yeah. And whether we want or not match, we just go with the change. Yeah. My passions and hobbies. My passion is to make sure, please God, that my family are okay. That's the first thing I would say. If once my children and grandchildren are healthy and happy, that's the main thing in life. Uh, I do love writing, I have to say. I, 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 I dwell in writing and I like writing. I only discovered last year that I actually am dyslexic. And to my, that's again going back to my school days, that was never diagnosed back then. People didn't know they had it even. So for me, I find writing, while I love writing, it's a struggle because I, I severely suffer with spelling. But I have to challenge that and I do challenge that and I get on with it. Uh, I do a bit of voluntary work for a group called NALA, National Adult Literary Association. And it's only when you realise the amount of people that are still out there that cannot read and write. It's actually devastating because one of the hardest and most difficult things for anybody, Matthew, I promise you this, is to admit that they can't read or write. It's an absolute stigma to carry around with you. So my passion to answer you would be writing. I just, I sit at home there at nights. I, I, I mean, I take up the biro or pencil, whatever I have, and I just tip away with the writing, yeah. Can you think of the point where you were at your happiest? That's a, that's a nice question. I, I, do you know something, and you might think I'm a plow mossy with you, I actually think I'm happy every day for once my kids are happy. That's been honest with you now. And I'm not a man that, that needs a lot. I'm not into the fancy cares or the holidays every year. I just, I'm as happy, and I swim every day in Black Rock. That's my solace, to be honest with you. Because uh, you come out here and there's one thing about the, with the water, Matthew. When you're in the water, everything in your head leaves you. Because you have two choices, you swim or you sink, you know. And I view life that way. So for me, happiness is about ensuring that people around you are happy, really, you know. Are there sad days? Of course there's sad days. I lost my brother Dave there, my, my friend all my life last June. And that, you know, that saddens me. But like that, he'd want me to keep going. And that's what, that's what life is. Like, as I say, when you look out here, in another hour, that water will be gone. And then back tonight, at half ten tonight, it's back in. So we, we, there's no answers to it. Happiness, I think, is it's, it's, it's up to yourself, really. What would be your proudest moment in life? Proudest moment in life, I would imagine. I have three children. I adore the three of them equally. But it would have to be the night uh, we had our first child, obviously. I think every parent will tell you that. <clears throat> but, you know, just to think that you go through your life and all of a sudden you're, you're, you're introducing life into the world. Yeah. But equally, I have three, uh, three adorable children and two lovely grandchildren. So I, I, I would be... A good family man, big family man, and that's, that's the way we were brought up, you know. You went back and completed your junior service. I did. Can you just tell me that? I will, of course, yeah. I think about 11 years ago, a good man called Tony Sweeney, my mentor right up to this day, came into the job where I worked the city council, and he asked a lot of us, would we be interested in going back and doing a bit of study? Now, I'll be totally honest with you, Matthew, that was not on my agenda at all, because, you know, I was, I suppose, 40-something years out of school. So Tony had that persuasive way about him. He was a very convincing man. So I said, look, I'll go back and I'll give it a go. And I went back and I set my junior shirt the first year up in Monagisha school with all the teenagers and little girls. And it was good. And I did well with the junior. And then Tony persuaded me the following year to go back and set my leaving shirt. And again, I did. Now, looking back on that, Matthew, even again, I never realised that I, had, I was dyslexic. I never realised that. So for me, study was exceptionally difficult because even with Tony Sweeney, who I adored, he was the only one that I could tell I had difficulty with spelling. And Tony got me through that gradually and slowly. And how I would spell to this day is this. I'd spell a word as it sounds in my head. I know it's wrong, but what I do then is I get my dictionary and I'd look through that and I'd spell it and spell it. And that's the way I go. So then uh, I did my leaving search and then two years ago I was lucky enough and honoured enough, I have to say, to have a book of poems published. Uh, Childhood Memories it was called. And it's, 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 look, what it is is an innocent book. It's, 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 it really is. It's not full of metaphors and that type of stuff. And it's doing very well, the book, actually. It's, it's sold out a few times in Charlie Burns and Tony Sweeney and, indeed, um, my, the publisher, Margaret Stewart, Margaret, uh, Tony and Boromore. Sure, I couldn't thank them enough ever, you know. To think that you could walk away from school at 12 
and in your 60s have a book published, I thought, now I look at people that would know me would know one thing about me, it's not for glory or praise I do it, I just think if anyone can look at that book and say, if he did it, I can do it, good luck to them, yeah. Do you have any regrets? Um, I don't, no, I have to say I don't, and again, it might come across as being plomacy, no I don't, I don't. Like, what is a regret? A regret is something you bring around with you that you're unhappy with, you know? And if you do that, like for instance, people would often say to you, playing soccer all the years I played with, did you make my enemies? No, I didn't. I got injured in 1985, I was only 24, 25, that finished my soccer career. Now, I could have been going around saying, look at poor me. No, I had to work, I had kids, so, no, regret is a word I do not like. I'll give you one story if I may. My daughter Aoife, she's, luckily enough, she's qualified as a solicitor three years ago. And when I went home one day after her first exams, she was in the sitting room with my wife, and the two of them in tears, of course. So I knew quite obviously what had happened. And I said, Aoife, what the hell is wrong? I failed. And I said, Aoife, you didn't fail. You just didn't pass. I says, to fail means you try, you, you, you didn't make the effort to have a go, Aoife. Keep going, I says, and you'll go and you will pass. And now thankfully she has, you know. The, the words I don't like um, is fail or regrets. No, I don't like them. Yeah. If you could go back in time and give one piece of advice to a younger Jerry, uh, what, what would that be? I think what it would be definitely would be this, because thankfully things have changed for the better. Make sure you get a good education for yourself, that would be the first thing. Because education is knowledge, it's wisdom to the other doors and so on. But the most important thing for me, I have to say, would be this, it would be respect of everybody. Respect e everyone equally as they are. I mean, you'd be amazed at walking this problem during the day when you might see somebody that might look down to it. But if you stop for two seconds and have a little chat with them, you'd be amazed what you'd find out about them, you know. And I think, try and share your knowledge. Don't, don't keep it to yourself. Share knowledge. Knowledge shared is a good thing. That's all it is.